Good afternoon, everyone. We're excited to welcome John Falberg of the Southeast Research Farm Board. John, if you want to turn on your microphone, you can go ahead and get started with your presentation. One more time. Hello, Sarah. I Hi, can John. hear you. Welcome, John. You can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. I can't see you, but I can hear you, and that'll do just fine. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Falberg, and I serve on the board of directors, which represents the Experiment Farm, which is a group of many, many farmers in our area of the state of South Dakota. And we are working with you folks from South Dakota State University on something called a collaborative effort. Our first bunch of, uh, of shots here are some of the research that's going on and we, it looks like we have a cow that needs to be reminded to uh, not talk with a mouth full of food. Anyway, let's, uh, let's go into the next uh, screen and we see a picture, an aerial shot of the experiment farm the two quarters to the left are the ones that the corporation owns and the top right quarter is one that we rent from a person in the area. Keep going. I don't think it gets said often enough, but because of the collaborative effort of our board of directors representing the experiment farm and everybody that represents the people who do the teaching, the research, the extension work from SDSU. This is a collaborative effort. And on behalf of us farmers representing the experiment farm, I wanna say thank you to all of you who do, who make the research possible, who organize it and make it useful for people to make use of. Uh, we owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude for what you have done. Um, you see a, a picture of one of the earliest uh, pieces of equipment doing research. And uh, it'd be interesting to wonder if that has ended up in the museum up at uh, Brookings or so. Here's a shot of our current uh, people that work here at the experiment farm. Uh, to your left is Scott Bird. He is our livestock technician, uh, although I'm sure he'll tell you that his talents get used other places as well. Uh, right now, he's right beside me making sure that my connection stays good. So thank you, Scott. Gerald Williamson is our ag foreman. Uh, he has probably been with the experiment farm about as long as, as any of the others, and his uh, efforts are just uh, so valuable uh, being able to speak from a, a point of uh, some years of experience. Chelsea Sweeter is also fairly new to the experiment farm. Uh, she's an agronomy technician and just headed out the door to do some spraying of a, of a section. Pete Sexton is our farm supervisor. He has been here for, I'm not sure, has he been here for 10 years? Something like this. And he has been wonderful as an innovator and question asker, which is what we do at the experiment farm, ask questions and find answers. Ruth Stevens is our senior secretary and I probably stay in contact with her uh, as much as anybody because I serve as the treasurer of the experiment farm. And there's always another bill to pay. Finally, there's Brad Rops as our operations manager and he's the one that kind of organizes a whole lot of the work detail. So thank you to Brad. Next, we see here a mission statement that the experiment farm developed uh, some years ago with uh, quite a bit of assistance by uh, Professor Doug Malo up at SDSU. I do remember having a soils class uh, with him quite a while ago. Um, a mission statement is something that every organization should have, whether it's an organization as big as SDSU or whether you're talking about your marriage. Uh, a good mission statement is something that you can hold up and pick whatever idea that you have and hold it up against that mission statement to see if it is relevant. And if it is, uh, good, investigate, do whatever you can. 
But if it isn't relevant to our mission statement, well, we can save ourselves quite a bit of precious resources not spending time on that, but instead sticking to those things that we need to pay attention to. Next. As I was looking over the herbicide valuations uh, uh, slide, I remembered that there was about three different ways that I could think of to accomplish weed control. One would be tillage, one would be the use of herbicides, and the other would be hand weeding. And the advent of, well, two things happened. Uh, one was the idea of uh, giving the weeds the torch. Uh, it was a it was an idea that just never caught fire or anything. But uh, the one that did was the use of cover crops, particularly rye. And Pete will be telling you more about that uh, later on. But the use of rye has enabled uh, the, um, how do I say, it, the crowding out of weeds, not giving them any space to compete. The small variety grain trials made me think of when I was at state many years ago, doing a research paper on oats and the disease of crown rust. And even today, that is a question that is still vexing our researchers, how to control rust in, in oats. And as soon as they come up with a res resistant variety, the rust seems to mutate, quite a challenge. Finally, there's alfalfa and forage variety trials as well. Next, the beef feedlot trials are something that Scott has quite a, um, a hand in just because of uh, his day-to-day -day feeding and tabulating records and taking care of, of livestock. Uh, the feedlot is something that we put a little money into a couple of years ago when we extended the concrete slab to make uh, cleaning pens easier and uh, improving the cattle's general state of affairs. The integration of crop and livestock looks like a bunch of really happy steers in all of that uh, forage out there. This kind of, of thing has been going on, not just in the United States, but in New Zealand, in Sweden, uh, and even in Brazil now. And finally, we have swine rotate ration trials. The swine unit is, is, uh, here at the farm is, um, is something that is uh, a small unit. However, it does allow itself uh, to be used for disease research, something that you would need to be much more careful of in a, in a larger setting. Next, here we have a multi-hybrid planter and this was a wonderful example of collaboration between uh, SDSU and private industry. Uh, twin row planters had come on the market and the question was raised, is there a way that we could get that planter to plant two varieties with this twin row planter? One variety for the challenged areas of a field and another area where we think that the variety should be uh, capable of uh, uh, of capturing the full yield potential that is available to it. And so this planter was purchased and sent over to Raven Industries and voila, we had a planter that was unlike anything else in the world. Next. Here's another shot of, uh, of grazing of cover crops and annual forages. Uh, there is some extra effort and labor that's involved with this. But uh, the performance of the, of the animals is really remarkable here. Next, here's an evaluation of hybrid, hybrid rye. And Pete will probably be talking to you more about uh, this kind of research coming up. Here's a few of the strategic goals of the Southeast Research Farm. And every year we take a look at this list, throw in a bunch of others and ask the board, which of these do we need to really key in on which would be the most useful in our research? And it's just simply acknowledging that we have limited resources to, to use in answering these kinds of questions. But going over those goals every year helps us to stay relevant to the needs of the farmers in our area. Next. 
Anyone is welcome to visit or call the experiment farm with questions. This is an open place. And uh, if you call ahead and make an appointment, we can usually make sure that somebody is available to take you around for your own tour. So on behalf of the board of directors, this is John Falberg. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, John. And yes. We appreciate you coming out and, and putting uh, the little introduction together today. And while um, our next speaker is getting ready to go, uh, we will be hearing from Dr. Peter Kovacs. He's gonna talk about corn nitrogen today and some of the work they're doing on the farm. And it looks like he is screen shared and ready to go. So uh, Dr. Kovacs, if you can hear me okay, you can go ahead and begin. I can hear you. Should I start my video or just go with the screen as it is? If you would like, you can sure start your video. Otherwise, the screen is fine. We can see it. Okay. Okay. Then I'll just I'll, I'll just stay beyond, without the uh, video right now, and maybe for the questions uh, if we have. So, following the introduction, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation to give some of the uh, results. What uh, me and my colleague, Dr. Jason Clark, is uh, working on in the past uh, couple of years uh, in our corn production studies. And uh, probably the couple of typical questions what we could uh, always uh, have to answer at the beginning of the season, what hybrid should we plant and how much of nitrogen we should apply for that uh, crop to maximize our yield and certainly maximize our profit. If we look at the corn development and their nitrogen needs, we know that uh, that is one of the most of the time, the most crucial uh, nutrient for corn production. We can start to see that we are right now about this V12, V13 growth stages or a little bit advanced depend on when you plant it this year. But even though if we are in sort of middle of the growing season, we still acquired or the plant acquired about 40% of its uh, seasonal nitrogen uh, needs. And certainly this was the past two or three weeks when we could see a large growth in both in height of the corn and biomass and certainly with some of the nutrients uh, uh, uptake and requirement. So if we think about how the weather and specifically the precipitation is around planting and at the early season, if you look at the, uh, the past two or three years, in 2018, and we have to watch carefully some of the scales, but uh, uh, we are comparing to 30 years normal, we can see the May month when, or uh, May and the June month when we usually plant are a little bit above the normal uh, 30 years normal. Uh, it was certainly the case for 2018 and 2019, although the June month can be a little bit uh, uh, drier or uh, above or around the uh, 30 years normal. This year, certainly we didn't experience as much of a, a, a precipitation uh, than the previous couple of years. So we followed sort of the trend line or 30 years normal here and there, some pockets of uh, heavier rain, especially in the month of June. But both with a somewhat increased precipitation, we can also notice when we get rain, we usually tend to get a larger amount at the same time. So how that can affect our uh, nutrient availability for the plant and how we should or what we should uh, consider. So if we look at the nitrogen cycle, and in this case, I'm really will focus on using uh, fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer as our nitrogen source and not combining with uh, animal uh, manure sources. So once you apply around planting, because that is the most typical or more typical around here in South Dakota, it takes a little bit of time that fertilizer will convert into this ammonium form, which would be really beneficial for us because both the plant can utilize and we will have uh, less chances to losing that nitrogen. However, 
uh, that ammonium doesn't really stay too long in that form and it will convert into a nitrate form, which is unfortunately a negatively charged uh, molecule. And if we get enough precipitation, that can move and can change its uh, forms within the soil. So if we have steady rain and, and a good uh, water flow, which would uh, be needed for the early season, uh, what will one of the outcome what we can have is that nitrate can go downwards in a, uh, in a soil, leaching out for for the plant or from the plant root zone. However, if we get some of those larger rain amounts where we can see standing uh, water for a few days, it can start to trigger a denitrification process, which will again at the end result uh, lowering our nitrogen availability for the plants. Plus, through the denitrification process, uh, it can also contribute to some of the global warming uh, uh, processes. So, thinking, combining the application timing and the nitrogen cycle part with our typical weather patterns at the beginning of the season and knowing how small amount of nitrogen do we need uh, to supply for that, or for that plant to grow, uh, we should start to think about how can we optimize our nitrogen application that that nitrogen will be there for the plants when it needs. So in a very simple uh, uh, example, when do we have the food ready or should have the food ready when we are getting ready for, or when we are getting hungry. So that would be the ideal goal uh, as we thinking about some of the nitrogen management. And hopefully by the end of the uh, presentation, you have some of the other alternatives that not just relying on the pre-plant application, hopefully if you do that, you do uh, close to the planting and not in a fall, but potentially consider some of the early season uh, application, whether it's a broadcast dry fertilizer or potentially using some of the uh, liquid or anhydrous ammonia uh, banded in the rows. Or in extreme cases, you can even go later to the mid season and uh, using some of the late nitrogen applications. So Dr. Clark and I started this study at the Southeast Farm and uh, other, uh, two other places in Eastern South Dakota where we started to compare 100% uh, pre-plant application to an early split application where we had a range of nitrogen rates uh, starting from zero to all the way up to four, 240 pounds of nitrogen in a 40 pounds uh, increment. And we compared to an early split application where we just gave a little bit of boost at the early season with a 40 pounds of nitrogen uh, applied pre-plant. And the rest of the nitrogen was applied at the, at, either at the V3, so three uh, leaf growth stages, or at the five leaf growth stages. And all of these nitro, uh, nitrogen sources were urea and broadcasted just to have a really simple application method. So from this 80 to 240 categories, we would have an easy comparison for a pre-planned V3 and a V5 split application. If we jump to the grain yields itself, uh, we can start to see in 2018, if you remember, it was really uh, or fairly bad. Uh, we didn't see any differences in our first year with a pre-plan compared to the other two uh, split applications. In 2019, uh, we were able to plant in mid-May, uh, the last day before we started to receive all those rains, uh, and we literally modded in that uh, trial. However, with that four and a half or so inches of rain in the following two weeks, uh, forced us to replant our trial. So once we replanted in an early season or uh, early June, uh, we have already applied all of the season long uh, nitrogen with our pre plant treatments. However, if you look at the V3 and the V5 applications, we have applied after that tremendous of rain, which uh, helped to increase our uh, yield. Uh, both for the V3 and the V5 application. And you can see 
the pre-plant versus the V3, overall across the four or five nitrogen rates, we were able to increase uh, 20 bushel uh, uh, yield. But if you look at some of the more details in uh, our trial, so in 2018, I believe this is 18, it's just the wrong uh, number, uh, the optimum nitrogen rate, we needed over 200, close to 240 pounds of uh, nitrogen to optimize or maximize our grain yield. And as we saw, there were no difference in yields, so we could see the same yield response. However, with a split application, we were able to lower that uh, optimum nitrogen rate with a V3 and also with a V5 application rates. So in, in the first year, even though we didn't improve grain yields, but we could say that if we would apply lower nitrogen, uh, we could get uh, the same uh, yield results. If we go in a somewhat different statistical methods and using a, a more of a plateau response rather than the quadratic, uh, we didn't really see any yield response above that 155 uh, pounds uh, per acre or uh, pounds per uh, acre nitrogen rate. In 2019, if you look at the same yield response, so we see more of a, a quadratic plateau response. So if you look at the response beyond that 180, 190 pounds of nitrogen, we didn't see any yield increase. For the V3 application, uh, we can see the main difference or the main yield bump were observed in these lower nitrogen rates and we didn't see further yield response about this 155 uh, pounds per acre uh, nitrogen rate. We go to the V5, somewhat uh, between the two V3 and the uh, pre-plant application in terms of yield response, and also the optimum nitrogen rate was similar in this case, about uh, 170 uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre. We also had some studies where we were trying to see whether this mid-season nitrogen application, intentional nitrogen application would work in South Dakota environment. And we picked two application timing, one at the V10 growth stages and one at the V14 growth stages. And you can see the different pre-plant application rates in a, a, a parenthesis. So we applied 60, 80, and 120 pounds just to see that is there a, speci a specific nitrogen requirement uh, for this type of um, uh, split application. So the pre-plant was broadcast uh, applied uh, our, or we broadcast applied our urea but uh, the late application was uh, using a 28 solution UAN uh, utilizing the wide drop uh, application system. So when we look at the overall rates, we had three different uh, total nitrogen rates, 120, 160, and 200 pounds. So the difference between that pre and the total rate was applied at V10 or V14 uh, growth stages. Across the treatments, we didn't see differences. And also when we compared to the pre-plant uh, application, so when we applied the same amount of nitrogen prior to planting, we didn't see uh, differences in 2018. Looking at the same comparison in 2019, and when we compared to the uh, pre-plant applications, actually one of our treatment was doing better or uh, increase the grain yield uh, compared to the pre-plant application. About so a minute left, Peter. Okay, I'm just about to wrapping up anyway. So, uh, so in a summary that uh, if you want to uh, try to go to the uh, split application, hopefully you will have other options and really one of the message what I want to uh, relay across during this presentation that hopefully it is not just the pre-plant only nitrogen management uh, options what we can have for corn. 
And if we do early split, we saw in the past two years that uh, we can improve grain yield and or lower optimum nitrogen rates. Uh, this study is also done this year, so it will uh, be really interesting how the results will turn out with a somewhat drier conditions, at least so far for the year. And I would like to thank you for the Salty Code and Nutrient uh, Research and Education Council for their support for this study. And uh, certainly the help from the Ag Experimental Station and from the USDA NIFA for uh, uh, helping us at, uh, at the university. With that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And Sarah, or the question will be now or at the end of the three or four uh, presentations. Thanks, Peter. We don't have any questions at this point, but if anyone has questions for him, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will cover them at the end. So at this point, our next presenters will be Dr. Peter Sexton and Dr. David Karkey, and they are going to talk about rye and the projects that are going on at the Southeast Research Farm. So I will turn it over to them. Thanks, Sarah. Uh... So the topic of the, our talk is rye, and it's kind of something old, something new. Rye was first domesticated about 10,000 years ago, and it's kind of been a crop grown on the margins because of its uh, high stress tolerance, especially against cold weather. And so it's kind of historically been seen as a, a marginal uh, uh, enterprise. And what the new part of it is with uh, development of hybrid lines, uh, the yield potential has gone up quite a bit, and I think that changes the economics of it for us. So next slide. So going back to my previous point, the something old, the rise defensive, high tolerance for stress. It's able to survive very cold conditions down to minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it tolerates wheat streak mosaic virus. It's less susceptible than wheat to fusarium. It's very competitive against weeds and it has modest fertility requirements. So our inputs are low and it's a, it's a, it's a tough plant. It's only weakness is it doesn't like to have wet feet. So you don't wanna put it someplace where uh, there's gonna be excess moisture. So on the new side, there's been new hybrid lines developed. We've been working with KWS seeds on those, evaluating them here in South Dakota and they effectively double rise yield potential. Another new development is use of growth regulators that can lessen but not eliminate risk of lodging. So we've got uh, materials we can apply that will shorten the plants up and rye naturally grows pretty tall. So that's, uh, this is something we think might be helpful down the road too. And a kind of a new development too on the market side of it is there's thought to be a benefit to gut health from the soluble fibers in rye, which are, has more soluble fiber than wheat does. So in that sense, it may over time help develop a, a market for it. Next slide. So the strengths of rye, one is it's got a fibrous root system. It's gonna help improve soil structure and soil health. It's multi-purpose, can be used for forage. Also, if you keep it for grain, you can bale the straw. Uh, provides an opportunity for fall cover crops and for manure application. And the timing and planting of, uh, uh, is offset from the corn and soybean cycle. So that gives spreads out labor and equipment requirements. And of course you have a rotation benefit because it's gonna interrupt weed and pest cycles. So this is some data from the Southeast farm and we've got two, three and four year rotation corn and soybean yields. And we see in the long term we pick up somewhere around six bushel an acre going from two to three year rotation and more recent data, which I think is perhaps a little more representative. We see about a 20 bushel per acre yield gain. And with soybeans, up, oh, could we go back a bit? Thanks. Then with soybeans, uh, we're looking at something more like two, maybe three bushel an acre uh, yield gain. So that's the other part of this from rye as a system. It's gonna benefit soil health, disrupt pest cycles, and we should see a uh, improvement in the yield of our subsequent crops also. Next slide. So the weaknesses, one is market uncertainty. And for this reason, we've been doing the work uh, with uh, the uh, animal nutrition folks and, and that's Warren Rushi and Zach Smith have led the way and that's supported by KWS Seeds also. 
looking at rye use in a feedlot. And uh, that looks positive, and you can hear more about that in a little bit from Warren's talk. So hopefully the marketing, if we can market it in the culinary area, then it'll be a high return, but that's a smaller market. And then the feed market would be a backup to it. Fall seeding is a weakness and a strength. It's a weakness that we'll probably have to plant a little bit earlier soybean line or follow oats with it to get it in. It's a strength in that it's offset uh, from corn and soybean and doesn't interfere with spring planting. Lodging can be an issue. I think these newer lines are, are more resistant to that and with the growth regulators, we can shorten them up. As I mentioned before, it doesn't like wet conditions. Ergot, we haven't seen much of an ergot problem unless we have an, we're on a tight rotation. So for us, we haven't seen that as an issue. Uh, leaf rust, we haven't had that problem, but it's a potential one. Contamination of wheat is an is a important issue. If you're raising wheat, you can't really separate rye from wheat. So you probably have to decide which one you're gonna do and stick with that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David, Dr. David Karkey to talk about the variety uh, evaluations. Thank you, Pete. Uh, yeah, you just uh, mentioned, you know, multiple use of rye uh, as a crop, you know, and then Pete and I have worked with uh, rye as a cover crop, biomass crop, and now we're, you know, uh, primarily focusing on the grain yield. Uh, so the table that you see on the screen right now is the data obtained in 2019 growing season. That means they were planted in 2018 fall on a soybean stubble. And 2019 wasn't a really ideal situation for uh, growing any crop almost, but uh, rye held pretty good, but wasn't the ideal condition. But, uh, and then you see on the table, and uh, it's been sorted as a, on the yield basis. So number one uh, yielding is tile, and which yielded about 105 bushel per acre. And like I said, you know, it wasn't the ideal year, but it does have another, you know, potential to go even higher than 105 bushel per acre. Uh, and we tested about, uh, I think eight hybrid, uh, lines and then three open pollinated lines and two triticale, three triticale varieties and one wheat varieties. As you can see, all the hybrid rye are bracketed on the top. That means they are, you know, top grain yielding uh, lines and for open pollinated rye, Hazlitt was the best. And uh, the best for open, open pollinated was almost half the yield than the, than the highest yielding uh, hybrid rye. So it does have that potential to, to double, almost double the yield of an of an open pollinated varieties or lines, uh, lines out there. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and general agronomy uh, about growing rye. I think uh, Pete Mench, uh, mentioned a lot of things there you know, in his uh, presentation also. Uh, and uh, here in the number one, you know, highlight point is avoid wheat. Uh, it can serve as a contaminant down on the road. Uh, and Pete does, did mention that you cannot really um, distinguish rye from wheat, uh, especially early in the season. So you can't really control that way. And planting time, uh, mid to late September, but uh, if, the, if the circumstance allow, maybe go earlier than later so that you'll have a uh, uh, good establishment and have uh, you know, optimum tillers in the fall before it goes to dormancy. And then it will take off in the spring uh, and be a good yielding uh, plant uh, down on the road. And seeding rate, uh, uh, 800,000 per uh, seeds per acre, roughly about one bushel per acre. Um, and uh, uh, for, the, for the hybrid rye, but for the open pollinated or the varieties that we find, you know, common varieties we find, we go about, about 100 pounds, almost two bushel uh, per acre. And this is all something that we're also working on, but you, you know, the seed provider, you know, uh, did highlight that uh, 800,000 is, uh, is uh, ideal for now. And seed depth as usual is one inch. Uh, and fertilizer, uh, it's again, uh, lower input than, than wheat, of course, um, one pound N unit per bushel of grain. And P and K would be uh, as for the soil test. And wheat control, like in general, you know, bronate uh, labeled for rye, uh, like it's labeled for wheat. And also for fungicide, there is a, there, there, there could be a chance of having some leaf, leaf rust early in the season. Uh, tilt or propiconazole uh, is labeled for, uh, for rye. And in this test, we did uh, evaluate rye for, for biomass and forest capability. So I will turn it over to Ben for highlighting some of the results and the forest aspect of things uh, in this trial. 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Brockmiller, and I'm just finishing up my master's degree at SDSU. And so for the past couple of years, I've been working with Dr. Sexton and Dr. Karki um, on some of these rye projects. So today I'd like to just go over some of what we've seen with forage rye. Um, so typically for, for biomass production, we're seeing at the Southeast Farm anywhere from around 1,600 to 4,800 pounds per acre. And it, a lot of what that biomass production is, is, comes from depends on a couple of different factors. So the fall planting date is one big one. Some of these uh, lower biomass production uh, years that we're seeing is when we weren't able to get the corn off until later uh, in, in the season um, around November. And then we see some lower biomass potential. But when we're able to plant that into the middle part of September, or the early part of October, we are able to see some more biomass production. And typically we're getting around 1,800 to 2,000 pounds per acre there. Um, also moisture is, is something that can have effects. So as Dr. Sexton mentioned earlier, rye doesn't really like to have wet feet. And so we see in some of these years where we have a lot of moisture that can reduce our biomass potential a little bit. And then our spring, bur spring burn down timing as well. And I'll have another slide on this in, in just a little bit where we can take a look at some of those trends. But generally, as we delay that burn down timing, we're going to see more biomass production. And also, uh, we're going to have more nutrients being taken up and more moisture as well being taken up by the rye. Uh, if we could go on to the next slide. Um, so, what, and if you could advance it one more too, we can look at these graphs maybe side by side. So, what we see here, um, this is some of our results from the winter annual forage trial. Now, the first thing we notice here is where we saw um, pretty big differentiation between our open pollinated lines and our hybrid lines in the uh, grain trial. We didn't see that differentiation so much in the uh, winter annual forage trial. So Hazlitt and Ryman, which are our uh, best producing OP lines, um, yielded highest around 2.3 um, tons per acre. And then Daniello, Daniello and Vinetto uh, were our top hybrid rye lines. Then in 2020, um, we saw more biomass production overall, but again, we didn't see that uh, differentiation between our OP lines and our hybrid lines. So uh, where, whereas we might see that benefit for the grain trial, um, there's a potential to save some costs by going with an OP line if our, our main goal is just for forage. Uh, if we could advance to the next slide. So then in terms of burn down timing, uh, we see that rye really takes off in growth around the middle part of May. So we can kind of divide this graph up into three different sections. So between uh, that first burn down date in uh, April 19th, all the way up to May 13th, so about a month, we saw 850 pounds of growth. And then in the next 10 day interval between May 13 to May uh, 23rd, we saw another 850 pounds. And then again, in that last 10 day interval um, up to when it, we got to boot stage, uh, we saw another 850 pounds of growth. So when thinking about it from a cover crop perspective, there's a potential to delay that, ter uh, that termination timing a little bit. And we still don't see a huge difference in uh, biomass potential and uh, nutrient uptake at the beginning part of the season. But then once we get into that middle to late part of July, um, if we're not looking for the biomass control it becomes very important then. Uh, if we could go on to the next slide. And then in terms of uh, harvesting for forage, uh, generally the, the time that we see the best uh, biomass with the best quality is right around the boot stage. And so this graph here that comes out of University of Wisconsin is showing how as we go past boot stage, we start to see a pretty uh, drastic decrease in our forage quality. So to optimize that and kind of balance the quality with the quantity, uh, boot stage is about the time we look for to be harvesting this for forage. And if we could go to the next slide. Um, so then what we can do after harvesting this for forage, generally this happens about the last week of May, uh, is we can come back with soybeans and we've seen some pretty good success with uh, planting soybeans late. Um, this data is coming from 2017 uh, when we had soybeans planted on June 12th and we can see some of the different maturity groups there we have and, and the yields we're able to get with those. Uh, so with this I'll turn it back over to Dr. Sexton. Okay thanks Ben. Just in terms of summary, uh, rye is very tough, winter hardy, competitive crop. So agronomically I really like it. It's uh, as long as you keep it uh, out of wet places it's, uh, it's an easy crop to take care of and the costs aren't too very high. Next point. 
Uh, it has real potential to improve soil health, and we need that diversity. So there's a potential there to benefit our corn and soybean yields. And this combination of good yield potential with a developing market for hybrid rye uh, makes us think it's probably has a profitable future or a niche in our area, especially for people that can feed it themselves. So if you can raise the rye and you can get in the culinary market and get a good price for it, dynamite. If you can't, you can feed it to your cattle. A person in that situation uh, probably is going to find the best fit for it. And so the hybrid rye is definitely uh, for grain production is definitely head and shoulders better than the open pollinated lines. On the other hand, for forage production, the open pollinated lines seem to do as well. And last point is just that caution again, it's kind of common sense. You really can't separate rye from wheat uh, either with the seed cleaning equipment or in the field very well, except by hand. So you want to keep them separate. Okay, I think that wraps it up for us. All right, before you sign off, we have a couple questions for uh, the three of you. Um, have you compared rye to triticale and how does it compare as a fall seeded grain crop in Eastern South Dakota ro rotations? Is it as big of an issue for winter wheat producers as rye is? Okay, we have included triticale in our forage trials. And uh, what we see is that uh, uh, in, when, the, when it's a hard winter, the triticale takes it on the chin and the rye keeps growing. So there's a real uh, clear separation there when we have, like let's say we have a, a bit of rain in December and then we have open conditions in January. Uh, the winter triticale will suffer under those cold temperatures more than the rye does. So, uh, um, in terms of, so for forage production, rye is definitely superior, especially if, you, if you've got difficult winter conditions. Uh, the other question is about the contamination. Yes, triticale is less of a hazard in wheat just because your mar the buyers are more likely to accept a little bit of triticale in there than they are rye. So on a marketing side of it, I don't know that people like triticale, but they'll, they'll, I think and you'd have to talk to your buyers and whatnot. But my sense is uh, there's a little more tolerance for triticale than rye as a contaminant. Okay, yeah. we had uh, one more simple question. Are the rye weights dry or fresh weight? Okay, the rye uh, weights there were dry weight. So there's about two and a half tons per acre last year. And this year we had quite a bit better, about four tons per acre. Um, this year we went in on oat stubble and the ground had a little better uh, uh, cover. Um, and, uh, but so we've got really in terms of silage about 12 tons per acre uh, equivalent yield, dry matter about four tons per acre this, this last year. Okay, and it looks like there's one last question here as we switch to our next presenter. Uh, what is the cost versus, uh, cost versus corn for growing rye? So rye versus corn, economically speaking. Um, well, I'm just going to take one point on the last one. The four tons per acre is really the upper end of what we've seen. So that's probably the ceiling. Um, so I don't want to think of that as an average yield. Four tons per acre dry matter is probably a, an upper amp limit for us or close to it. Okay, in terms of cost, the seed's expensive for hybrid rye. Uh, the nitrogen, is gonna be, let's say 120 pounds per acre. So let's say $60 for nitrogen. Uh, tilt, if you need a fungicide, is cheap. It's about four or $5 an acre. Um, and we haven't used tilt. We haven't had a need for it, but if you do, that's not an expensive one to deal with. Bronate's pretty cheap. Uh, there you go. Um, and then you have your costs of, for, uh, 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 getting it seeded and, and combining it. Um, I haven't added, I've added all up yet. I guess maybe they could get back to you, Sarah, and we, you and I can come up with an economic spreadsheet for it. How's that sound? Sure, that could be done. I think, um, like you said, Peter, there's some, there's some differences in the way that you manage the crop that could really affect the economics, especially depending on the year. So that's a good question. Yeah, it's going to be cheaper than wheat or corn to raise, but this, to give you an exact number, I'd have to sit down and pencil it all out. 
yeah, your, your inputs would be less, but there's some risk there yet. So it depends on your market. Well, I think um, for the sake of time, thank you to David, Peter, and Ben, and we will move on to Warren Rushi, who's going to switch gears a little and talk on the livestock side about our feedlot research that goes on at the Southeast Farm and, and maybe otherwise what projects Warren is working on. So I will turn it over to him and let him screen share. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, uh, give me a thumbs down if I don't have the screen right, but I think we've got everything set up. Looks uh, good. I'm, I'm sorry, what was that, Sarah? Looks good. Okay, good. So uh, Dr. Sexton, Dr. Karkey, and Ben have done a really good job of uh, talking about some of the reasons why cereal rye uh, fits in an agronomic system in an integrated uh, operation uh, in terms of potential improvements for sil you know, just system resiliency, soil health, and so forth. And he's also touched on some of the, the potential with the new hybrids that we have offering increased yield potential, also with reduced ergot incidence compared to population genetics. Uh, we think that's critically important as we shift, talk about livestock feeds, and we'll talk about that a little more uh, as we go on. We also know that in South Dakota, though any feeds, any crop that we raise that can also be fed to livestock, uh, that's really a double benefit for us. If for no other reason, it gives us additional market out market outlets uh, in case of uh, poor price issues or production problems or so forth. The challenge with rye, at least as a cattle feed grain, is there's just very little information on that. Most of the work that's been done, uh, the most recent I could find was some work done in Canada uh, on dairy heifer calves from the 1980s. Uh, other than that, most of it's older than that, going back as far as the 30s. So it, there hasn't been a lot of work done recently and certainly not a lot done with modern cattle genetics and modern cattle diets and management practices. The other part of that is most of those work, research work that was done used rye that have a greater concentration of ergot alkaloids compared to what we would see with the new germplasm. So what uh, we were approached by KWS cereals to, uh, to answer really three questions. Uh, if we feed rye to cattle, are they going to eat the feed? Will they perform and how well will they perform? And then finally, what would the energy value of hybrid rye be if we start supplementing rye for dry rolled corn? The rye grain that we used was uh, provided by KWS Cereals USA. Uh, we used the, their hybrid KWS Bono uh, that uh, Dr. Dr. Peter Sexton talked about uh, on some of the real yield trial information. We did have that tested at North Dakota State University. Uh, it tested at 392 parts per billion for ergot alkaloid concentration. That is at a low enough level that you would not expect any kind of toxicity issues when you put that into a, into a livestock diet. We did crack this using a roller mill uh, that was provided by, uh, the, by a local manufacturer here in Southeast South Dakota. And we processed that rye grain to a test weight of 42 and a half pounds per bushel. From a study design standpoint, we set this up having four different treatments. Our base diet, and I'll show the diets here in the next screen, but it was uh, your very typical Midwestern cattle finishing diet based on dry rolled corn at 60% of the diet on a dry matter basis. And then we took that base diet and substituted one third, two thirds, or all of the corn with hybrid rye, resulting in four treatments that uh, we're going to be uh, designating as 60 0. 40, 20, 20, 40, and 0, 60. From a cattle standpoint, we used 240 Angus cross steers that we sourced from a single consignment at a sale barn in central South Dakota. They came in weighing just under 800, excuse me, just under 900 pounds. We set this up as 24 total pens, 10 steers per pen. So we had six pens per each treatment. Uh, we shipped these cattle to Tyson at Dakota City uh, when we estimated that they had reached a half an inch of back fat. All of the final, anyway, final uh, performance values that we're going to talk about are uh, adjusted using hot carcass weight. Uh, we adjusted a, to all of the hot carcass weights to a common dressing percentage of 62.5%. The reason we did that is, if you recall, uh, in late December of 2019, uh, we had some snow, had some rain, temperatures really never got 
below freezing for a very long period of time. So the end result was pens got sloppy uh, and the cattle were carrying a significant amount of mud and tag and that really skewed some of our dressing percentages. We thought that the most accurate way to report all of this uh, was to adjust everything to a common dress to take some of those uh, external factors out of the equation. This was our, uh, our final actual diets we fed. Uh, you can see on the top two lines, those are the ratios of the corn um, and rye that we intended to feed. Uh, we had approximately 19% modified distillers, 17% corn silage, then about 4% of a liquid supplement uh, that was uh, formulated to meet or exceed all their requirements for vitamins and minerals. As you can see on the bottom two lines, uh, or two of those three, uh, that as we increase the amount of rye in the diet, crude protein content increased and, and also fiber content increased. Uh, and we knew that was going to happen. Uh, the rye grain has a greater crude protein content than the corn it was replacing. And so rather than try to uh, substitute corn with and distillers at the same time, we elected to just substitute corn, realizing that then we are actually feeding extra protein uh, to some of those higher inclusion rate diets. So as we move on to the results, if you recall, our first question was, well, are these cattle going to eat the feed? Uh, and, and so this chart uh, shows the performance during the adaptation period from day one to, to day 18. We, in, we began introducing rye to the experiment diets on day eight. Uh, and over this period, we were also, so we were also introducing rye, but also adapting the cattle to high concentrate, uh, to a high concentrate diet. Uh, and we were pleasantly surprised uh, that as we increased the amount of rye during this adaptation phase, cattle actually performed better. Uh, they gained faster and were more efficient. Uh, that was not what we were expecting. Uh, we had no issues with the cattle consuming the diets. Uh, and so this was uh, a bit of a surprise to us and really uh, really kind of got us excited about the rest of the project and uh, see what might happen as we go through the rest of the feeding period. This uh, chart shows the, the dry matter intake pattern uh, as we went advanced on days on feed through the feeding period. Uh, you can see through about day 48 or 49, there were no differences in dry matter intake between these treatments. However, once we got past that point and started uh, going long, continuing in the feeding period uh, to the end of the trial, the treatments started to diverge. And the treatments that uh, had greater inclusion rates of rye reached a plateau at a uh, reduced amount of feed intake and, re and reached that plateau earlier compared to the treatments with less rye or the corn-based control. Uh, we think maybe a couple different things that may be causing that, and we're not exactly sure. Uh, we're not certain if uh, perhaps uh, even at low levels that an extended exposure to ergot alkaloids uh, might cause uh, intake depression. The other possibility is that um, we may have processed the grain too finely. We know from uh, small grains and barley and so forth that if we create too many fines uh, with a high inclusion rate, uh, we can depress feed intake, which might have been what happened here. Uh, as you can see early on when we were feeding more roughage through the adaptation period uh, and, that, and through the first portion of the experiment, uh, when our total deliveries were, were less, uh, we didn't have as many issues. But as we started challenging those cattle uh, and asking them to consume greater amounts of feed, uh, the cattle with more rye in the diet uh, uh, weren't able to respond as well as those with less rye in terms of feed intake. Uh, this particular bar graph shows our carcass adjusted final body weight. Uh, as we increased the amount of rye in the diet, uh, the cattle were lighter at finish uh, compared to uh, the corn based control. Uh, note though that that uh, second bar, that 40 20 treatment, where we only replaced one third of the grain, one third of the corn rather, uh, was nearly identical to what we saw in the corn based control. Average daily gain and feed efficiency followed a very similar pattern uh, that as we increase the amount of rye, uh, cattle gain slower, more, more slowly as shown by the yellow line and were less efficient as, as shown by the blue bars. But again, just as the, we saw with the final body weight, uh, the 60-0 and the 40-20 treatments were very nearly identical. Uh, one really critically critical factor as we're marketing uh, live cattle or, or finished cattle is that we want to make certain anything we're doing is not detrimentally affecting uh, um, quality grade and carcass characteristics. So I have one graph here which shows the quality grade distribution 
and uh, feeding rye to these cattle did not affect, did not negatively affect at all the, uh, how well these cattle graded. Uh, they were all very similar across all four treatments. Uh, if I put up the, the slide with uh, yield grade distributions, it would look very similar. Also, we also took uh, measurements of liver abscesses at the slaughter plant. Uh, we did not find any difference in terms of either the incidence rate of liver abscesses or the severity. So uh, we didn't do any harm by feeding rye to these steers. Uh, it didn't see any improvement either, which is one of the things we were perhaps hoping might happen, uh, but we certainly didn't do anything uh, uh, detrimental from a carcass standpoint. Increased rye in the diets did reduce dressing percentage. However, as we talked about earlier, this entire group of cattle did not dress well uh, because of the mud conditions. Uh, they were 60% or less on a dress, on a dress basis. Uh, so we interpret that with a lot of caution uh, that how much, of, how much of what we saw might have been due to dietary treatments or how much just might have been some carryover effects uh, because of uh, the mud and environmental conditions we saw. One of the other objectives then of this study was to estimate uh, net energy value. Uh, so using the performance data that we collected combined with the carcass information that we received on these cattle, uh, our estimate is that the net energy value for maintenance for rye was 87.5 and the net energy for gain value was 57.2 megacals per hundred. Uh, the published values, uh, if you look at a couple of the key references that the, the industry uses to uh, create diets, either the NASM or uh, the tables produced by Dr. Rod Preston, you can see that we're very, co very closely aligned with those published estimates, which gave us some confidence that uh, our experiment uh, fell within what it should have, what we were expecting, and we didn't have some uh, really strange values that we'd have to try to explain. Uh, the bottom uh, row on that table shows what the uh, Dr. Preston's estimate for dry rolled corn would be. So in the final analysis from an energy standpoint, rye is approximately 84% uh, the, the energy value of corn. So the conclusions of our study were that uh, we can in fact successfully feed rye to finishing cattle. And if you remember the average, da average daily gain slides we had, uh, even at the highest rate where we did see some uh, intake depression and poor performance, those cattle still gain four pounds a day, which uh, you know, would be certainly very competitive with in almost any yard in, in South Dakota. Uh, we also concluded that increasing the amount of rye in the diet did depress dry matter intake after 48 days of feed and depressed or decreased average daily gain and, uh, and feed efficiency when measured over the entire feeding period. Uh, as I said, just said in the last slide, our estimates of energy values were approximately 84% that of dry rolled corn. And we think uh, a, a potential area for some additional research would be to uh, take a more in-depth look at some of those factors I talked about that might have explained why uh, dry matter intake uh, was decreased and if there are any kind of mitigation steps we could take uh, to uh, manage around that issue. Uh, just a couple real quick slides before we uh, turn things over to, to panels. Uh, we think there's some other potential unanswered questions or intriguing possibilities with this crop. Uh, things like, you know, what happens if we were to blend this with the uh, high moisture corn or earlage? What would happen if we harvested this earlier and harvested as high moisture rye and, and maybe opening up the window to, to get a summer annual forage crop in? Uh, could we take advantage of that, uh, the fact that the Earlier in the study, the cattle consumed rye just as readily as they did uh, the higher corn diet and maybe use that fact and shift more of the rye feeding to earlier in the feeding period uh, and then shift over to corn later. And then along with what we just mentioned about things about processing time, uh, what happens if we feed uh, feed sources where they're even lower in ergot alkaloid uh, and how might we use this in a backgrounding diet. I came up with this slide as just a thought experiment that uh, pigtailing off of some of what um, Dr. Sexton had talked about, where if we had a corn soybean rotation on a theoretical 1200 acre farm uh, that grew 600 corn, 600 acres of beans and produced 180 bushels of corn, what might happen if we turned that into a three crop rotation 
where we got the yield bump that Dr. Sexton talked about, where now we went to 200 bushel corn and 100 bushel rye yield that uh, has been achieved here at the Southeast Farm. And when I do the math, there's two things then that, that come up. Number one, uh, we produced enough extra feed grain in that scenario to feed an additional 275 head of yearling steers, uh, which might be really valuable for bringing someone else into the operation. Uh, and, and also, uh, it ends up matching up really well with that two to one corn to rye ratio in terms of what's produced on that farm, uh, where that was the the highest performing treatment of our three rye treatments in our study. So finally, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is exciting about hybrid rye is it also offers some increased options, as we've already talked about, in terms of the potential to harvest early for a forage crop, uh, gives us, opens up the door for a double cropping system. Uh, we can harvest for grain and sell to the highest value market, if that's uh, baking or distillery, or we can feed it on farm uh, and add value to it that way. Uh, also, the one thing we have not talked about at all, uh, but the uh, the straw resource that's produced by this crop uh, has tremendous value from both a production standpoint uh, and also from a resale and reduces our reliance on corn stocks uh, from a production system. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge KWS Cereals USA for their financial support on this project and for their in-kind contributions of rye grain. Also like to recognize Mr. Scott Bird. Uh, Scott did an outstanding job of taking care of these cattle last fall, uh, keeping them fed, keeping them healthy. Uh, we couldn't have done this project without him. Uh, we certainly appreciate his contributions and want to make sure we recognize that. Uh, here my, is my contact information. Uh, and that concludes my portion of the program. Uh, and I'll open up the floor for, or open up to the rest of the team for any kind of questions. Thank you, Warren. Um, I think that was a great lineup of speakers. Uh, before we lose people, we do have a panel available for questions. So if you can hold on for just a little bit, um, there'll be a Q&A session here and we do have some questions for Dr. Kovacs. Warren, I don't see any for you at this time, but if someone has some, please type your questions in the Q&A at this time. Um, I don't see any questions yet for you, Warren, but I do see a question for Dr. Kovacs, and we will have um, anyone that is interested in asking questions to those people that presented on the recorded field tour, um, which we'll be showing the link here shortly. Those panelists, several of them are available here as well. So feel free to ask questions of any type that might go with the recorded field tour video as well. Um, for Peter, Peter Kovacs, the second application was urea, correct? How was that applied to the field? So on the early splits when we did the V3 and the V5 application, that was urea and we, we personally on the uh, plot we hand broadcasted, but uh, we tried to simulate or, or mimic the, the broadcast application. Uh, one of the method what what I showed uh, on one of those slides. So probably the easiest way to to roll into the split application, whether it's uh, through the co-op or if you have your own uh, uh, applicator. Okay, thank you. Looks like we have a few more questions. I just want to point everyone's attention to the chat. Uh, Lindsay has put a link in there. So if you weren't aware, there is a formally recorded field day session that was done at the Southeast Research Farm with several videos. So watching that would be much like attending the field day on top of this live webinar. So if you go to the link that she has put in the chat, um, that is videos of all the projects going on at the farm that were highlighted during that virtual field tour. And the recording of today's webinar will be available at the link she lists as well um, next week. But currently live is the recorded field tour from the Southeast Farm. So if you'd like to see that, please click that link. Um, Warren, it looks like we do have a question for you. Uh, can rye be used for silage? And um, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Rye can be used for silage and it's used very successfully by a, a number of producers in this region. Uh, as one of the speakers has already talked about, the, the key from a quality standpoint with any grass forage is uh, stage of maturity when harvested. 
So if we uh, can harvest it sooner, uh, that gives us more quality. Uh, if we do elect to go later, uh, then usually gets us more yield. So some of that then depends on what the objectives are. You know, if we're trying to put up a lot of feed to uh, win our beef cow herd and that quality isn't of paramount importance, we may let that get a little more mature. Uh, if we're looking for some really high quality feed stuffs, uh, uh, then we need to harvest earlier. Uh, the, uh, the difference, I guess, from a silage versus hay uh, is depending on what our feeding system is. Uh, but if we're, and I'm speaking for feedlot cattle, but when we can introduce a, uh, a wetter feed stuff combined with some drier feed, usually supports better intake, uh, helps in terms of mix integrity, bunk management. Uh, there's some real benefits to having a uh, higher moisture feed in the diet. Um, obviously, it's not going to have the energy content that corn silage would do. So, if, you know, depending on what our objectives are, uh, that we may need to increase grain content if we're trying to substitute for corn silage. Okay, thank you. It, they mentioned that that might be more of a better use for them, the silage would be, and I think you kind of covered that. Um, we also have a question for you, Warren, from Jack. What is the effect of the extra protein for cattle just um, short of the comments that you made today? But what's the effect of that extra protein? Well, in our experiment, we don't think the protein had any um, positive or negative impact in terms of cattle performance. Uh, uh, these steers were, were big yearlings. Uh, the protein requirements are... You know, at 13 percent or so, we should have been in more than more than adequate to support the kind of performance we had. Uh, in a production system, though, uh, what would likely happen in you know if we were really putting this together in a diet is by using rye grain because it has more crude protein than corn, we may be able to uh, pull out some of the distillers uh, and reduce the inclusion rate of distillers and still keep our crude protein content at the 13 and a half, 14 percent or so. Okay, thank you. It looks like at this point, those are the questions I am seeing. However, um, do note for those of you that are still on, I see most of our attendees are still here, we do have several of our uh, panelists that were at the field tour day also available. So if you have questions um, on pests, like the weeds plots that are going on at the farm, on forages, um, on other research studies that are going on with grazing or feedlot, please feel free to ask them. We have several of those people online today and here and available to answer questions. So if you're curious about anything going on at the farm under any of those agronomic categories or more, um, now is the time. You can sure type that in the Q&A, or if you're having a hard time finding that, you can use the chat function. And I think we'll give people a couple minutes here while the CEU credits are, are up to look at that. Um, I looked up some fun facts about the research farm while people were giving typing questions. I thought this might be interesting. And John covered a little bit of this at the beginning. But a group of progressive farmers started the efforts to create the Association for the Farm in 1955. Um, does anyone know what year they actually started researching at the farm? If they were actually able to plant and start their research projects? Oh, Zach knows, 1961, good work. <laughs> and I also thought this was interesting um, the original purchase of the farm acres occurred in 1960. They purchased about 320 acres to become the Southeast Experiment Farm Corporation. Uh, anyone have a guess of what it costs per acre in 1960? It's kind of entertaining, actually. It's kind of sad now. <laughs> I'm going to guess $250 an Pretty acre. Pretty close. Pretty close. So the, it was actually $200 an acre. Um, and how they raised that money, uh, they sold $25 memberships to farmers and businessmen in the 10 county area. So people that gave more than $25 were issued a certificate of interest, which is kind of fun. 
Um, and I wonder if any of those are still around. Maybe Ruth has one somewhere in the office. But they, they raised enough funds to pay for the south half of the farm and then they used a loan to pay for the north half. There was also a foundation, the Carl Norgren Foundation provided a, a large donation to get it started as well. So I thought that was really interesting. I'm not seeing any questions coming in. But again, I encourage everyone to go to, <laughs> I just got one that says coffee and cookies. Virtually, sure. <laughs> Sorry, that's the one drawback of uh, a virtual field presentation. But I think there's been a lot of benefits to all of our virtual world uh, too. So there's, there's some pluses and some minuses. Um, but we really thank you all for, for joining us today. And again, if you need the CCA credits, make sure you scan the code now because there won't be um, another opportunity to do that. And again, this will be available online. So be sure that you go to the link that Lindsay has posted. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. You can email anyone here um, of the panelists. And with, without further ado, we, we thank you for joining us. On behalf of the Experiment Farm and uh, the South Dakota Egg Experiment Station, have a great day and hopefully we will see you in person next year at our field day. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.